Good evening. Hi. Welcome to the 45th edition of the AI and AI Fame webinar. Pandemic has disrupted everyone's lives, and at the same time, it also gave all of us an opportunity to regroup and rethink our individual strategies and tactics in a new normal. Our association too ensured that to keep alive the flame of alumni bonding glowing, the webinar series was initiated. Now today, let's get a peek into the ACE marketeers' minds on how they have gone about in achieving their corporate targets and top, targets and goals. Today's topic, disruptive marketing ideas in B2C business. To expound on this interesting topic, we have three interesting and engaging alumni amongst us. Alok Shankar, MBM 96, Country Head Fitbit. Alpesh Ashar, MBA 2005, COO, Faces Cosmetics. And the Sutradar is our man for all seasons and reasons. Rahul Seigal, MBA 2004, CEO, Friday and Theo. Over to you, Rahul Seigal. Thanks, Nikhil. Uh, I'll just spend the next 45 seconds to a minute introducing the topic. Uh, and, then, and, then, and then we'll move into the questions. Uh, and, and this is the context I wanted to set, is that, is that many businesses have evolved over the last six months, thanks to COVID. Uh, than uh, they have in the last six years. Uh, and a lot of this change is actually being led by brands and consumers needing to find new ways to connect. Yeah, uh, And in this phase of business transformation, what we've been finding is that marketing uh, in many, many cases uh, has been at the forefront uh, leading this entire change for businesses. Uh, I also personally think that uh, there is no better time, no time more exciting than this uh, for anyone, whether they're starting their careers in marketing, whether they're mid-level or senior, um, you know, to enjoy a career in marketing. Because I think that today there are so many new things uh, that all of us uh, can actually do. So today's session is going to focus on all the disruption that's taking place in the space of B2C marketing. Uh, you know, um, uh, I, know, I understand that businesses are transforming and, and there's a lot of innovation that's happening, but, but in order to uh, keep a tight focus on this session. We will talk only about disruptive marketing uh, strategies and tactics. Uh, and for this discussion, I'm very happy to have, uh, you know, Nikhil, you've already introduced them. Uh, uh, Alok uh, Shankar, who's the uh, CEO of Fitbit in India. Uh, and, and, and we've also got Alpesh Asher, good friend and, 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 and uh, a bad junior. Uh, we spent some good times in Manila. Uh, Alpesh is the chief operating officer of Faces. Faces is um, a cosmetics brand um, uh, owned entirely by Sequoia. Okay, uh, so I'm going to dive straight in and, and here's my first question. My first question is to Alpesh. Um, Alpesh, what would have taken five years to achieve in terms of consumer behavior change um, has actually happened over the last five months. Uh, can you give us any examples uh, from the kind of stuff that you are, or, or, or from your experiences at Faces, where you're seeing this change uh, take place in Akka? Hey, uh, thanks, Rahul. Uh, firstly, thank you so much, Nikhil uh, and Rahul, for having me here in this session. Uh, it's great to sort of be a part of this network and be speaking uh, on a topic uh, which everybody is tracking so uh, closely. Yeah. Uh, so a couple of things, Rahul, to answer your question. Uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, disruption in the way the world is changing, the world is shopping, right? Uh, I was just looking at some data, you know, when Nikhil uh, threw up this topic, uh, and I was uh, really, like uh, pleasantly surprised to see that, you know, we today have around uh, 300 million plus uh, people who are on social media. This number is going to uh, uh, move in excess of 500 million in the next uh, five years by 2025, right? But uh, I think the uh, couple of changes that we have typically seen in the ecosystem around us are. Uh, there is a huge, uh, you know, trans, uh, a consumer change in terms of consumers who are typically buying on horizontal platforms uh, and vertical platforms are now looking at own platforms uh, owned by the brands. And uh, that's typically happening because uh, consumers uh, see a lo lot of uh, trust and credibility coming from a brand. Uh, the other considerations remain the same uh, now uh, in terms of uh, convenience and faster delivery. Uh, that's one. The second thing that we're seeing is a lot of on offline brands who had a big retail presence 
have now you know clearly you know uh, ready themselves to fight this uh, uh, to fight out for the customer in the online world so for example you know in in our category in space uh, touch and feel consultation is a huge trigger for uh, driving purchase a lot of this has now started moving online right so you have uh, you know uh, say beauty advisors who are part of our stores are moving online offering online consultations right technology also has you know uh, is changing rapidly uh, there was an article a couple of days back that uh, google is now launching uh, an augmented reality feature which typically means that consumers will be able to uh, try uh, what they want to buy so think of it in this way right the touch and feel that was there in the offline world is now happening in the online world was this ar feature there it was there uh, but google you know with google coming in now you can understand how will they massify it completely right so uh, that's something uh, that is happening the other thing the fourth thing before is uh, in my uh, in my mind you know we had seen an explosion in e-commerce right a few years back and we see you know how online shopping has moved to a lot of uh, uh, players apart from amazon and uh, uh, flipkart right a plethora of d2c brands that have sprung up uh, again data suggests that you know there are 600 plus d2c brands that have cropped up in india that are actually occupying you know very niche spaces they have targeted the product and price uh, wide spaces and are creating uh, you know spaces for themselves uh, the uh, an extension of this right uh, which i call the ecom 2.0 is uh, social commerce that's going to sort of be the next big thing uh, now this is social commerce and nothing but conversational commerce and uh, what this means is you have a lot of people uh, offering you advice offering you suggestions and helping you aid uh, and take your purchase decision right so to give examples uh, you know players platforms like say facebook or mishos or bulbuls or foxies of the world right uh, they are the ones to look out for because uh, social commerce is here to stay and what it typically does is uh, you know on a uh, on a e-commerce platform right uh, a, a person can just go and buy a product uh, uh, in conversational commerce the credibility sets in uh, before i take a uh, decision to buy the product got it thanks alpesh um I guess if I can, uh, Rahul, yeah. with your permission, add just to that, uh, as Alpesh mentioned, especially on online, and I think um, that's a very good point uh, because many brands till now were letting some of the other platforms actually lead their online initiative, right? Especially say the Amazon and the Flipkarts of the world. And as Alpesh mentioned, because uh, due to pandemic, we were getting over-indexed on online. I think it made a great case also for. the brands themselves to have a online presence because that is the place where you can actually truly uh, display and communicate the best you possibly can right because you have that platform fully in your control and some of these technologies that uh, that alpesh mentioned you can probably execute them better so uh, having a brand store i think makes a lot more sense and it's almost like table stakes right it's hy- hygiene now for every brand to be present online and do the best job that they possibly can Okay, Alok, I'm going to request you to just uh, speak a little louder. I can hear Alpesh, but I'm struggling a little to hear you. Okay. You yeah, yeah, that's much better. much better. Okay, okay. 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 Do the so, CP. Be loud. Okay. Yes, be loud, and 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 it also means that I I could not understand anything that you said in the last. Uh, I I got it. I got minutes. it. So so I'm going to ask you a follow up question. Yeah. Uh, to the first one, and forgive me if if you've already answered that in the last two minutes. Uh, but but what I wanted to hear from you is that is that if um. if there's a lot of behavior change that's occurring right now see when when you look at consumer behavior change no yeah. uh, there are there are there are there are there are two things that actually happen one is the consumer behavior changes automatically okay consumer behavior typically takes a long time to evolve okay people don't start behaving differently overnight unless unless there is some shock that's come in and that's disrupted their normal behavior and now is given them a need to behave differently right covid has been shocked that today you know your behavior changed overnight and everybody started wearing masks for example it's it's shocked um now now this type of this type of now 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 when this behavior is changing okay what i wanted to understand is that is that a lot of organizations saw this as adversity initially 
And then slowly over a period of time, people started trying to make sense of the adversity to try and find some opportunity. My question is this, you know, are there any examples from your current organizations of how marketing is leading this change, this behavior change? And what is marketing doing? What tactics or what strategies are you putting out there in the market to make people behave in a manner, in the desired manner? I can give you an example. If, yeah. if, if it's, go ahead, go ahead. I, I, an example would be, for instance, you know, uh, during COVID, if fewer people are, are going out to exercise, okay, because they don't want to leave their homes, and, and, and you are a brand that's connected to fitness, then what are you going to do to change the behavior such that your product becomes relevant to their lives? Okay. Um, great question, Rahul. And to some extent, actually, what we say is we are a behavior change company. Okay. Because uh, being uh, uh, well and healthy is basically what it comes down to is the fact that you change your lifestyle, right? To get long-term meaningful benefits, you have to really change your lifestyle. And lifestyle change means behavior change, okay? But uh, we also realize that uh, behavior change is one of the toughest things to do. It's not the easiest things to do. So if I try and address your question first to say, how, are, how is marketing helping people change behavior? I think that's a fairly difficult question to sort of answer because we can probably uh, what we also do is nudge, we can educate, nudge, and then maybe reward, right? That's kind mm. of a, a feedback cycle that you can follow, that you can educate, then you can nudge, and uh, nudge to do something specific, right? You What the outcome that you want, and then a reward to kind of reinforce, right? It's one of the very basic sort of feedback circle that we use. So in marketing, I think it, we need to encompass all of those aspects. Um, and as I said, starting from first educating or making people aware, right? And, um, and certainly what we have seen in the last six to nine months, especially as everybody has been consigned to home, you can't go out. So way people are consuming information has changed drastically, right? And as El Pesh also mentioned, whether it is actually selling a product or just informing a consumer right and what we are seeing is also there are multiple screens that have come in right people probably are multitasking even as we are on the zoom call i'm sure there are few people checking their phones and possibly the tv is running in the background okay india did lose massively otherwise there would have been cricket to follow too but um, uh, the thing is you have multi screens and uh, multiple means of consuming information which not only means that you are consuming information through the traditional sort of formats such as print media and TV, but also through the social platforms, right? And that is probably what we will see more and maybe during the conversation, see that you know, people are spending so much time on social media. So through marketing, what we need to ensure is kind of have an omni-channel presence, okay? Because you don't really know where you will really get your consumer. You could get them anywhere, right? So handhold them or catch them across different media, across different platforms, and really start first with communicating. What do you stand for? Yeah? What is actually happening? And if I look at health and wellness industry specifically, and you mentioned that you couldn't really go mm. out, you couldn't go to the gyms and things of that sort. So what did we pivot on? We tried to make a lot of content available through online means, whether it is through apps or YouTube, because we know video consumption has grown, gone up like crazy, right? Uh, also vernacular, so that is going crazy. So we made a lot of workouts available online. Right? <clears throat> made a lot of premium content, which have been would have been paid for, available free. So people can actually use use that and and do a workout. Right? We informed them a, a lot more about how to maintain your sleep well. Right? What is the importance of eating well? What is the importance of sleeping well? What is the importance of really keeping your heart health good? Right? So that is where the marketing point of view, educating them, then making them aware of what probably they need, and then giving them the opportunities to buy. And if you want to complete the feedback or the loop cycle is, hopefully you will also give them a great experience through your apps and services, post their buying decisions so that they re remain your loyal customers. So that's really what we see. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a follow-up question. And sure. there's two very important points of it, Arun. One is you said, you know, you spoke about the traditional 
funnel. You spoke about awareness and then consideration and then, you know, um, you know, you get more information and then finally there's the closure of the sale, etc. You know, yeah. Yeah. that is one thing that you mentioned. Then through your conversation, you also mentioned something else. You said that today people are on social media, people are here, people are there, people are accessing you from 10 different points. Yeah. My question is this, you know, 10 years ago, it was so easy to define the funnel. The acquisition funnel, you said that, okay, I will create awareness through these one or two things. I will have advertising. I've got television. I've got print. India is still a television country. I'm going to do massive television advertising. And then slowly, 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 you know, as I move through the funnel, I have, I have a certain dropout rate. And then, and then, and then I, I, sure. I, I move from a higher degree of awareness to a higher degree of uh, one-to-one -one engagement. And that's how I actually uh, right. ultimately close my sale with the uh, right. shopper or the consumer. Yeah. But what you're talking about is that there are so many points from which consumers can access your brand that my question is this, how do you as a marketeer figure out where to start the acquisition funnel? Is there a formula for that? How do you do that? Actually, I'm not sure if there's one formula uh, or a success story really. And I think for all of us, it's also a learning cycle, right? And uh, the good thing about all of this uh, explosion of uh, I think digital technology is, is also the fact that we actually are getting a lot of data, right? And um, the good thing with that data is that we are, all of us individually are really getting tracked to a micro level, right? Literally our every click through could be tracked by somebody or the other out there in the cloud. So what that uh, gives, uh, that is a great information for a marketeer, right? And they can then start to analyze Obviously, you have to start with the basics to try and say, okay, what is an ideal customer in your mind, right? You do all the basic stuff. What my firm belief is that basics are really the foundations of any building that you want to build, right? That will never go away. <clears throat> you really have to be good in the basic side, which actually, in some sense, if I were to relate it back to our MBA experience, starts really from the company's mission and vision. What do you really want to go out there, right? So some of those basics will never go out of fashion. But what is happening today is, because of the vast amount of data available, you can actually go down and try and see where all my potential consumers are, right? Where do I farm them from? And because of that, I can actually have very focused um, campaigns, uh, very focused sort of messaging that I can give, which can be sliced and diced to a micro segmentation, right? And that is where I'm saying is that I, I to improve my efficacy and maybe the ROI of the campaigns that I run, I'm actually using a lot of the data that is getting generated and then attacking them. So like I said, they can be omni-channel. In the past, we would catch them maybe in offline and convert them online. Today, probably, especially in today's time, we are catching them a lot more online and also converting online, but I'm finding them everywhere, whether it is on the social media platforms, they're just on the search engines. That is why I think as we go through, you might hear a lot more of the terms SEOs and SEMs, right? So that is where we are trying to be more efficient and more targeted for our potential customers. Uh, Rahul, if I may add to yeah, that. I, think I was just going to come to you. Yeah, please. Yeah. So uh, I think the framework today in the digital space is certainly evolved, right? So wh what, what organizations do is look at the digital space to say, you know, this is a medium to access our customers. <laughs> After access, I will move on to engaging with them, customize my offerings, uh, you know, further connect with them and then collaborate with them, right? That's the framework that has typically evolved. Now, having said that, uh, you know, uh, what, uh, you know, what data has also suggested through all the online campaigns that have been running, right? Uh, global media spends digitally, at least at the end of 2019, before we were hit by COVID, was in the range of around, say, 48, 49%. I'm sure after COVID, this would have zoomed uh, to post 60% levels. But a, a law of distribution, right, uh, as to how organizations look at uh, the efficacy of campaigns is, uh, you know, 90% of the people whom your campaign sort of touches are mere observers, right? 9% uh, uh, are semi-active users, only 1% are active participants, right? Uh, so, you know, <clears throat> in trying to, uh, to answer your question that you asked, Alok, uh, I see it as, uh, you know, there are customers today who are omnipresent, who are both in the offline space as well as online space, right? The mechanics of sort of targeting them online through the various social media platforms that you have, right, uh, uh, would be, uh, you know, uh, your campaigns may be different, but in the end, uh, this is a framework that I believe, you know, uh, one needs to, you know, organizations will follow 
to uh, acquire customers and then uh, you know build them uh, uh, get connected with them and then you know uh, continue sort of uh, uh, seeding them so that they stay loyal to the brand okay now boss we are going to switch track a little better <clears throat> now all the gyan session is over all the marketing frameworks all the mrr foundations all are very clear now we want specific examples and campaigns give us examples from your life give us examples from your organization or give us examples that you see as best cases from other organizations of what is actually happening you know because otherwise um, uh, i'm 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 just getting a little scared that this session might become slightly theoretical okay so my next question is i'm going to start by by uh, asking you alpesh yeah okay and alok spoke a lot about data you also spoke a lot about data yeah and we are seeing this entire convergence now uh, you know uh, four or five years ago we used to laugh when people used to say that the new brand manager is actually going to be a guy who can write algorithms okay mm. the new guy who uh, define segmentation is a guy who can write code but today a lot of that is actually becoming reality right yeah. so yeah. what i want to understand is are there any examples that you can see from faces or even from other organizations mm. where you see this beautiful convergence of how data technology and creative solutions are coming together to deliver one solution got it got it let let me let me break this into two parts one is give you give you some examples of where you know uh i've seen this sort of being implemented in, org- in organizations and how people are using data the second is you know uh, uh t- try to answer how data now has typic- how big data is becoming important uh, to organizations so let me start with some quick examples right uh, lest you tell us that you know we are going the mrr route down the mrr route uh you know uh, uh, when uh, falguni nayar launched nika uh in the initial days the only thing that she did and she burned the midnight oil was act looking at all the customers reviews reading all the customer reviews and you know uh, picking up all the advice and suggestions that customers gave to her with respect to product uh, assortment uh, delivery right everything that you know uh, was being done on nika was actually being emanated from there right so a lot a large part of the strategy was you know linked back to saying let me listen to what the consumer is saying and this is what she was doing uh let's say for uh, uh, recent examples right if you look at uh, uh, say arvind brands or say even rimmels right uh they are now looking at uh, they take their traditional businesses uh, they are taking a very different view instead of uh, going and launching their own platforms and uh, moving behind them uh, they are saying we will tie up with the uh, uh horizontal marketplaces of the world and why because uh, there is, there is so much rich data and con- con- customer information uh, sort of in there that the, once we start getting access to the data and start mining the data it will tell us a what do we have to launch where do we have to launch what and so on and so forth right so a lot of what my, what my innovation funnel will actually be derived from there right so you know what are the triggers for that is going to be derived from there let me give you a very rec- uh, of, of you know a new age example of a d2c brand right uh, if you go on to amazon uh, or flipkart you will see there's a brand called wow cosmetics right they're very famous for apple cider vinegar or uh, even of even an onion shampoo and a conditioner right we wouldn't have thought that we would use we thought deer shampoo was the last thing to happen now we have here about an onion shampoo right uh, what do they do they rely a lot so they work very closely with this marketplaces churn out data rely a lot on this data to typically say what are my consumer preferences and accordingly launch products that are more regional in nature right rather than saying i i i'll launch one product which is going to be applicable for the entire country so i think that's the uh, you know the, the power of data that people typically see today uh, you know when people start uh, shopping online you can actually start tracking their behavior their habits their interest levels right plus the feedback that you get right away right and so many businesses i mean think you let me talk about you know some d2c brands that have made really big like uh, plum for example plum cosmetics again founded by one of the ex unilever guys funded by unilever uh, went down this route right a big brand uh, mama earth right which took a very different approach to say i'll have toxin free uh, products right for baby care and uh, mother care right again went down this route now what is interesting is right and important to note when you compare the traditional uh, organizations right 
they would have taken anywhere on an average around 14 to 15 years to reach a 100 crore mark and you'll be surprised the names that i just took a wow a mama earth a plum they have taken on an average 3 and a half years to reach the 100 crore mark now that's the power of data in this medium right let me move to the second part of the question that you uh, 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 to the second part that i was referring to now how big data is going to actually help organizations i mean you know one is you have people are trans you know i am selling through horizontal marketplaces or vertical marketplaces or you my own platforms but then i have so many data points that i am typically capturing right i have my resident sap in the warehouse and erp i have a distributor system right uh, i may have some other system that i am using for my customer loyalty now how do i bring these various data formats into one big shell call a data warehouse or a data lake and then say now ask them any question and they will help me understand what kind of data has to be what kind of uh, answers do i want i can ask the questions and the data will be in front of me right so for example uh, you know if i want if i were to launch a new product and understand which where is it that these products are going to get the maximum revenue contribution in which zone region city even pinning it down to a pin code level or to a store level if i were talking in the offline format so i think that's the power of big data and uh, uh, as 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 we move ahead right i think this is one big uh, uh, disruption that's going to sort of come along right now i just want to conclude by saying uh, in this an interesting statistic right i like keep throwing this you have to you have to sort of uh, Uh, allow me to right uh, if you know if there are 100 organizations that typically have access to data there are 10 people who are diagnosing data diagnosing data but there is only 1% of the population of the organization who is actually using this data for decision making now that's what is going to create the difference in my head okay and 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 sorry just, sorry just one follow up question before i move to alok and i'm going to ask alok uh, uh, to respond uh, uh, to the same question in a bit uh but um do you have a very well defined data marketing sciences function at faces helping you take day to day marketing decisions so we we are putting the we are putting the infrastructure in place so uh, we don't have a uh, we don't have a department right now rahul but we clearly see the need to sort of set this up in the near future now having said that uh we are you know speaking to partners who can help this and you know uh, operate at, at as our extended arms right uh, through their premises and uh, you know again like i said i was pleasantly surprised when i was farming around for such partners you have established partners and partners in the startup world who have done some amazing work right and uh, they again simplified it so if i were to talk about a little bit uh, uh, and explain how this works so you know there are people who have actually uh, got their own solutions to say that you know i will seamlessly merge all the data pipelines that you have when i say data pipeline so i have different sources of data right and they said i have a simple solution which will it is like a plug and play right whereas if you go to the more traditional sandesh you know i have to bring this all together in one place then you know route it through one common data pipeline into a data warehouse now yeah. these are differences that have started emerging right so even there we're seeing fabulous innovation fantastic uh alok you want to respond to that to to try and help us understand uh with a few examples of how um uh, you are leveraging data uh, effectively uh, to take marketing decisions specifically marketing decisions actually it comes back to both marketing and maybe also in product innovation isn't it because um, as alpesh mentioned there is obviously because of all that has happened in technology there's almost like a real time feedback that you can get right you can do all your ab testing also almost in real time so if i were to look at say health and wellness for example um, all of a sudden you saw that um, we are all now aware of what pulse oximeters are right i'm sure almost 100% of the people on this call now know what are pulse oximeters and why it is important for all of us to have that right? so if you look at our devices the wearable for example that that we had um that was something that we had from last 3 years we could actually monitor uh, you know oxygen saturation in the blood for the last 3 years but all of a sudden what we see is and this is not only the feedback of consumers but what's happening in the world um uh, that we brought that feature mainstream into the products right so now on my wrist the device that i'm wearing will actually show me what my oxygen saturation is it's not a separate device so this is like a real feedback 
obviously you can say data or, or not of what is happening. Similarly, um, the, another sort of case in point is, can you be predictive, right? Can we predict through our variables whether there is going to be an onset of disease? And this was especially tailored say around COVID. And guess what? Yes, we already had the data from consumers. We could actually pivot very quickly, look at algorithms, do some testing, and, and, and actually we could be in a position to tell you um, that you might be getting symptoms or even before the symptoms appear, you know, there could be that you may be falling unwell. So there are, uh, you know, real kind of benefits um, that, that you're getting in product innovation. And then taking that, like I said, communication into the market to, for people to be aware that, hey, I can buy a device, which is a wearable, technology driven, and, and it can keep me healthier. So some very, very real implementations of that uh, which are happening, Rahul. Okay. Um, uh, Alpesh, I'm going, to, I'm going to ask you this question, which um, <laughs> is in... Okay. Okay. Before I ask you that. Um, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, somewhere through the course of uh, your conversation, Alpesh, and you said that there are some 600 or 700 new uh, brands that have launched um, uh, recently uh, in the... Uh, you know, in the B2C space, a lot of them are uh, direct to consumer, a lot of them are uh, online. Uh, you spoke about, uh, you spoke about how a lot of these um, organizations uh, or, the, or, the, or these brands are, are focused on, on very specific customers and, and, and they, could be, they could be very, very specific uh, customer segments or even geographical segments, right? Yeah. And, and they, don't, they don't necessarily need to have a national footprint. And I think you're absolutely right. I see a lot of these brands actually getting launched in the cosmetic space and in the FNB space. And all of them have only one story. We're natural, we're organic, we're, you know, toxic, you know, we, we have uh, uh, toxic, uh, no, no toxicity and, and so on and, <clears throat> and so forth. Um, a lot of these people are also, um, a, a lot of these young entrepreneurs, a lot of, not young entrepreneurs, a lot of the entrepreneurs uh, are saying, uh, and, and I'm coming closer to the question I want to ask you, are saying, that uh, you know, I can do contract manufacturing from somewhere. I can do my uh, warehousing with somebody else. Uh, Alpesh has some friends in data, and uh, you know those friends can give me all the data help and support that I need. Uh, Amazon uh, or Flipkart or somebody or, or Runner or, or uh, Shiprocket or whoever it is is going to give me uh, doorstep delivery. Therefore, all that I need to focus on is 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 if I have an idea, then I need to focus on brand. And what this is leading to is, is what we are calling marketing first organizations. Mm. They're, not, they're not necessarily product out. Of course, you know, there's, product, there's, there's all of that, but, 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 but indulge me for a bit. These are marketing out, marketing first organizations where all the core skill that you need is branding. Frankly, I think that the core skill you need to run the government also today is branding. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the core skill, see, uh, years ago, 20, when we graduated, uh, you know, many years ago, the co you know, uh, many people said marketing is a support function. Hmm. Today, a lot of people say, is a, a saying that brand building is the number one skill that you need to have in order to make these types of organizations successful. What are your views on that, Alpesh? So, uh, I think I let me let me sort of answer this in two points, Rahul. Right. One is uh, look at what's what's happening around us. There is a strong ecosystem, or at least a very robust ecosystem that has been built for you know new businesses or brands to take off. Right. And uh, uh, like you mentioned, if I wanted to start, if I had found if I have found a niche or I have a, a business idea that I believe can sort of uh, be tried. Uh, I have uh, platforms where I could go list the product. They will help me in discovery. They will reduce my customer acquisition cost, right? And I can uh, focus on uh, selling from those platforms. Uh, I have manufacturing setups, uh, 3PL, uh, who are who have now opened up and are ready to work with even the smallest of the guys to sort of uh, manufacture. And this is happening all across the world, right? Third is I have uh, you know fulfillment partners in terms of last mile delivery for to customers, right? And they have sprung up today, right? There are aggregators who bring together, you know, the FedEx's blue darts of the world, right? And they tell me, you know, you place an order on my platform, I will actually connect you to the guy who is the fastest or who is the cheapest or whatever, you know, uh, uh, is, your, is the filter that you want to apply, 
right so today what's what's happening is uh, for the d2c brands this has become a uh, i mean it's it's i mean the ecosystem there is uh, is already in place for one to get started right now let me come to the second part of the question uh, in terms of you know like you said it was first look it uh, in the uh, old olden days they put it this way it was looked at as a supporting function but now it's a primary function right but absolutely as if uh, i think today brands right are typically created because there is a lot of engage apart from awareness there is a lot of engagement today and where is engagement happening right engagement is happening on the social media platforms either it's paid marketing or it's organic push right now look at how the world is changing and this is where i want to bring in a point around you know the influencer strategy you know a, a couple of years back we heard about you know uh, social media is you know giving rise to a new set of uh, uh, individuals called influencers who collab with brands and uh, help them drive those brands create awareness how has the world changed today even influencers right they say is going to be a, a if i'm not missing a 10 odd billion dollar industry by 25 uh you have influencers who are termed as mega influencers macro influencers micro influencers and even nano influencers right so imagine at the stage at which i am right in my life cycle i can actually decide to choose who are the influencers that i want to collaborate with because they bring to the table their own strengths their pros and cons right uh i think that's how the world has changed uh you look at what's happening to the right google has realized that 52% of the people right typically who search on google are millennials and they are not buying from google right they are actually buying from the social media platforms from the conversations that are happening on the social media platforms some uh, and uh, a few to that extent where they buy directly from the ads that they see on facebook and don't even leave the app right so see how the how the way the transactions are happening so now they think link it back to if i were a brand where do i want to be i want to be where my customer is right yeah. that's that's where i'm going back to so my customer is on these platforms and saying typically you know uh, help me understand you know tell me what is uh, if if i am there and if you are there and if you meet my expectations then i'll be there let me add one more point here which is very a very interesting uh, uh, point that you know uh, when i speak to people around everybody is been making that because in their researches or their conversations uh, you know millennials right uh is is one huge uh, customer segment that people are uh, uh, you know quite optimistic about and what is typical what are the triggers for them right typical uh, that are going to help them pur- make purchase decisions uh you know and let me uh, give an example in the beauty space you know the concept of clean beauty in their heads is very clearly established and i'm saying i'm amazed at the clarity that you know the young folks have something probably that at least i didn't have at that age right and what does clean beauty mean to them clean beauty means that your products are today made in an environment which is toxic free your they don't contain chemicals your products don't contain chemicals they are not animal tested even to the extent that the packaging that you have is an eco friendly recyclable packaging now these are triggers that you know brands are realizing are very important to have on their uh, packaging right and talk about it loud and clear uh so that consumers start you know understanding it uh, because this is what they expect uh you guys may want to try after the call right there is a brand uh, which is coming in uh, a called copran which has just been launched by uh, uh, you know uh, a few months back in this right it offers a hygiene uh, like starting with hand wash and then they will move on to other uh, uh, categories but again what this is this is chemical free toxic free and the packaging talks very loudly in case this is recyclable packaging right you don't it's not going to harm the environment so on and so forth and these are things that you you see across categories where millennials are getting attracted to got it i have a tip for all future moderators don't discuss your questions with the panelists beforehand because they will answer it before the question is asked <laughs> 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 okay but before i move to the question on millennials and we really want to spend some time on this alok can you talk about maybe two or three brands uh new age brands these new marketing first companies that are giving you a solid run for your money and keeping you up at night actually uh, uh 
it, this, this, I know you're the big daddy in the space, but no, 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 no. It's, 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 and it's, 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 it's nothing of that sort, actually. Uh, because if you look at the uh, and this, your question, I think I can answer also as a follow up to what you said, whether it is marketing first kind of a concept, right? So maybe I know the time is running out, so I will be try and brief, uh, be brief. A um, couple of things. Um, I look a little louder, a little louder. I, I think this is again an evolution of how you know businesses get done, right? Whether it is R and D first, is it uh, operations first, is it marketing first? You know what is first, and I think for different industries and at different points in time, uh, you know different functions could probably take precedence. Okay, uh, if I look at my technology space that I've been part of, and especially mobility, there have been times when there have been companies which just brand marketing, as you said, and source the products from one manufacturer or the other. In Indian context, more recently, if you look at the uh, smartphone or mobile handset space, again, all the Indian companies were probably doing brand marketing, right? They did not do much in terms of R&D or actually manufacturing. And guess what happened? The guys who actually were the manufacturers have taken over the market. And the Indian brands, to that extent, have lost out. So there is a good balance that needs to be had. Yes, you can start with marketing. You can lead with that. But if the, if the business overall is not a balanced in that sense, you might probably lose out more than win it. Coming back to our sort of space, if you look at that, actually wearable is a very nascent industry still. Okay. And till a very few years ago, the question that we were always asking ourselves, what is the killer app? Yeah. Why do you need a wearable? Isn't it? Because it was good to have a smart sort of watch on your hand. But the question that we have always been asking is, what is it that we want to do? Okay, And for us, we decided it was health and wellness. So for us, the health and wellness piece was the killer app. Okay, um, But in terms of competition, it is uh, what, what we feel is that it will still take a little bit of time for it to kind of become a bit more settled and mature, like say a mobile phone side of the businesses. Right? It is quite, quite mature in some sense. Here, the consumers are also evolving and discovering as to what exactly is it that they want versus need. And especially what we see now in the last six to nine months, I think there are a couple of very clear indications that are happening, which is that variable probably will become, or and technology will actually become uh, more medical grade and they can be curative and therapeutic in some sense, right? You can actually use variables and technology to cure things like type two diabetes. You can actually cure, and I'm not using that word lightly, so you might have softwares or applications which can give you the same benefits as taking medications, right? And they can drive that kind of a, a, a physical change in a person, right? So what we are seeing at the moment though is the competition comes more from maybe an extension of mobile phone features and functionality. But as it becomes more and more sort of science-based and that is where, again, I'm probably overusing the word data, the big data comes into the picture people who have more data, people who have better algorithms and who can marry with better hardware will be able to give you that superior outcome, right? So at the moment, all the phone manufacturers are my competition because for them, it is a logical extension to have a device. They already sell phones. They have a logical extension to sell devices, right? Because you already are aware you might be a user of one of those phones and their brands and you can say, hey, now I have a variable, let me buy that. So at the moment, like I said, my competition coming from mobility, but maybe going forward, my competition might come from health uh, equipment manufacturers like GE, because they might certainly think, hey, guess what? There can be an ECG machine on the wrist. And I just make those big ECG machines for the hospitals, but maybe I need to make those for the wrist. So the competition can continue to change. And that is where we as a company and any business needs to scan the environment and see where the next competition is probably coming and and you are ahead of them. Uh, Rahul, uh, yeah. if I could add in, uh, since Alok spoke about uh, you know, uh, mobiles and manufacturers, I, you know, I just wanted to share an example of, uh, you know, all of us know MI and Xiaomi, right? When they came into India in 2014, uh, MI phones, yeah. uh, when they came into India in 2014, I think, uh, uh, they, what did they do, right? Where uh, from then to now, they sort of become the number one uh, mobile uh, sort of smartphones. Uh, smartphone seller, right? Number one, number two, they keep oscillating. Uh, Samsung has overtaken them again. But they did a very simple thing, right? What uh, So they had, you know, apart from the fact that their 
the prices are low but uh, i think the the, the uh, trigger that actually helped them start selling well was they did a very simple thing right every time they launched a phone so they typically said we'll create this we'll create a hardware but it is important the software in that hardware that is going to sort of take us ahead so every time they sort of launched a software they ensured that they had a set of beta testers right to whom they rolled it out first and uh, you know uh, that company was quite big in china that point time when it launched in india they said every time there was feedback coming from any beta tester right they used they used to ensure that within 7 days that feedback was taken into account and it was sort of solved for either solved for or you know the customer was sort of uh, reached back to and said that things can be done cannot be done and that's how they started i mean through these beta testers they actually started building what uh, uh, came to be known as the me community mi community right and uh, they did a phenomenal thing they said okay uh, you know we want ca- this community of customers to talk about not us and other brands very openly in these forums so they created these groups right on social platform to say come here talk about me very honestly openly you can praise me or bash me right but i am sitting here listening to you and i will uh, come back and tell you you know uh, if there is a misunderstanding or if i have to correct something i will do that i think that continues till this day and you know uh, I, i i know this because uh, uh, you know having been with shami when shami started in india uh, our community was you know a few hundred people now it's a few million people in the country and uh, uh, i actually had calls from you know uh, industry folks like samsung and others trying to understand you know ye xiaomi ne aise kya kiya hai how do we build this community right and i think that's the power of the medium now think of it today right and i'm linking it back to what i said a, a, a while back uh, how are smaller or new age organizations trying to do this they saying we want to build our community of people now a i can either start uh, recruiting such people creating those uh, customer cohorts or panels or i will use my influencer network to start making customers loyal to what i want to offer to them right that's how i'm seeing this is coming together that's interesting okay we we we're, we're moving into the into the last couple of questions i don't want you guys to drop off um we've got something exciting coming up at the end of uh, at the end of this q and a session uh, at the end all of you all you need to do is just put up your wrist on the camera everybody needs to do it at the end of the session whoever is wearing a fitbit is going to get a 10000 rupee a uh, gift hamper from faces our budget was 10000 bucks but alok said i can't give you any fitbit for 10000 bucks <laughs> and 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 alper said you can buy my tie shop for 10000 bucks deadly hamper coming up with the state you okay i'm going to go back to a question i'm i'm going to go back to an answer <laughs> that a pitch has already given so i'm going to pose it to you alok uh, this came up in our conversation a few days ago when we were talking about this session and it's about millennials uh we're talking and and this is this is you know we're naturally moving uh this conversation from saying that you know all of these new age brands are launching um we understand that the people who will adopt social commerce um uh, and and buying on the internet first will be the younger lot it's not to say that the older people will not shop or buy okay but but we know that the millennials will adopt it very very quickly my question is this that you know are the triggers for brand consideration changing for millennials i am not so sure actually that if they are changing yeah um, i think what is happening probably is like a, like we discussed in the beginning where are they forming their opinion or where are they getting that information from i think that definitely is changing like we said and and you said the the basic sort of feedback loop uh, that we talked about is that initial consideration set, set that you have right so how does one form that initial consideration set right so the challenge for the marketers um, again today is to ensure that um, you know especially for your brand and your product you are part of that initial consideration set because all studies show that if you are part of that initial consideration set then your ch- chances of conversion are much higher than if you are discovered through the journey of evaluation right because what do you do you say oh i want to buy a fitness tracker so instantly you might have two or three brands which come up in your mind correct ideally you need to be you want to be one of those two three four brands that comes up on the mind once the consumer has that kind of a mind uh, you know mindset okay i want to find out maybe i want to buy 
they go on a journey of discovery. So then they will, and that is where, you know, the various kind of the mediums come into the picture. Before maybe it was print and TV more, maybe just friends. Um, now it is digital and they are still friends. And as Alpaish said, they are influencers maybe, you know. That is why you have so many models and, and people like, you know, Virat Kohli's of the world uh, kind of and endorsing products. They have millions and millions of followers. And so yeah. influencers come into that. Then when it is coming, the time of purchase, the moment of purchase, once again, because you are a millennial, you may actually not walk into a large format retailer or a mom and pop store. You want to click and buy, right? And that is where it again connects back to maybe what Alpesh said, and we all know whether it is horizontal marketing platforms or vertical or whatever you have, you need to have an omni-channel strategy to be able to convert at that point in time. The more frictionless it is, the better your chances of conversion are, right? We also know that. Yeah. So that is where I say that possibly not changing, but you just need to be... Uh, but Alo, I just want to, I want to pick up yeah. from a point that Alpesh was making. Yeah. Okay, and, and here's what I picked up from what Alpesh was saying, and I'd like you to comment on it. Yeah. Um, uh, what he was saying is that um, in today's context, okay, so, you know, um, when you're buying into a brand, you're buying into a story. Okay? Yeah. Uh, that story could be about product quality, could be about pricing, could be about benefit, and so on and so forth, could be about its features, and so on. Or the story could be about the fact that it is, you know, uh, uh, Alpesh spoke about environmentally friendly packaging. He spoke about uh, this brand um, uh, is, is, is an honest brand, uh, high, uh, high levels of integrity. And they have ways and means of demonstrating why, you know, uh, you must believe uh, that they're good for the planet. Sometimes brands sell more when they're good for somebody else, they're not good for you. And, 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 and I mean that loosely. I mean that loosely to say that I'm good for the planet and I'm not necessarily um, uh, good in an extremely acute manner just for your very selfish consumption, right? And then that's what they're telling consumers. Do you feel, and, 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 and again, I go back to this, uh, uh, this, this, this same line of questioning that some years ago and five years ago, and some years ago, we would, we, you know, we would advise clients and we would tell them that, Are, boss, don't come up with, all of this stuff about good for the planet and environmentally friendly, nobody cares. Give them five rupees off and they'll buy your product. Do you think that the reverse is happening now? I feel that it is. And therefore, I'm, a, I'm you know, and, and, and Alpesh mentioned that he thinks he is. And, and I just wanted your point of view on, on this. What do you, uh, the last part of the question, the reverse, you mean? Yeah. So, 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 uh, you know, um, is, is that are, are millennials buying for reasons that were very different for why people bought products 10 or 15 uh, years again, ago. Again, my, 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 my answer to that would be like, uh, again, I have uh, two young daughters. Well, you know, it's not your son, so young anymore, but millennials, right? So if I uh, look at the category that Alpesh was talking about, especially, uh, you know, cosmetics at large, uh, I certainly see that my daughter would have, as Alpesh said, a very typical person who would have said, I don't want animal testing. I don't want so on and so forth. A little forth. louder, Alok. So, so yeah. like Alpesh said, my daughter would probably go in and, and be one of those who will be very careful about the environment. But she's not going to use a shampoo just because it is environmentally friendly. She uses a shampoo, right? She uses a conditioner. She's using a soap. But what she's really looking for is, I don't want a soap packaged in plastic because now the awareness is higher that plastics is not good. So can I get a soap which is paper packed, right? Similarly, can I buy a shampoo which is maybe in glass bottle or some other reusable sort of packaging or recyclable packaging? But it's not that the, she is going to buy a product just because of the packaging or why it is good for the environment. It has to have some basic need to start with. That is still my sort of view in that. that yeah, it's the decision making point. Where are you overweighing or what is the weight of various aspects? And and being environment friendly is definitely a, a good thing uh, in the young generation. If I look at technology side, like I said, which I probably know a little bit more, um, what are the other things that can be a decision making criteria? And for us, uh, what we see is data security, right? So data security is a big thing. It's not the fact that your device may be the greatest device, but today you and I and everybody may have concerns about our privacy and data, right? So is the company handling my data in a secure manner? And that can be a decision-making point. Some of the biggest mobile phone brand, I will not take the name of the brand, but some of the biggest mobile phone brand 
the advertising is all around privacy. Do you see that, right? What they're saying is, whatever you do online, I will ensure it is private. I will ensure it doesn't go fall in the wrong hands, right? So those are other elements which will trigger, but it will not mean that I will go and buy a mobile phone because my data is private, right? I want to buy a mobile phone and I want to ensure it is because there are two or three other aspects which it takes care of. Yeah. Rahul, I got it. Just, yeah. Uh, Rahul, got if it. I may add just one, one quick and a short point. Uh, you know, on the millennial habits, uh, what we're also seeing, right, is, uh, you know, when we reach out to them through, uh, you know, uh, an organic campaign, which is uh, led by, say, influencers or conversationalists, we see a 1.5 times uh, uptake uh, in the conversion rates, right, uh, compared to they just going and trying to buy something uh, on a digital space. I think when they're actually assisted or they're influenced, right, we are seeing that there is clearly a 1.5x delta in uh, the CTR rate, right? And now these are these are these are big indicators, right? Telling us that you know how this entire habit and behavior is changing. So they they want people to tell them, you know, what is this product about? Uh, you know, why is this good for me? And why is apart from it being good for me, right? Uh, why is it also safe for the environment? Super. Okay, I'm now going to move to the last question. Uh, and then I'm going to request Alok to talk about it. Uh, this is more for uh, uh, younger people on this group. Um, uh, and and, and when, I, when I say younger, I mean people uh, who graduated recently, uh, who are now exploring a career in marketing. What advice would both of you give, Alpesh, you're going first, to them? Uh, for very specific skills that they need to pick up today in order to make themselves future ready for marketing. Okay. Uh, you know, a... Uh... Can you write? <laughs> I think that, that has changed now. Changed now. <laughs> After uh, three years, can you also work on Excel? Excel. What is it now? Uh, so... Uh... Uh, so Rahul, this is this is how I think, right? Uh, a couple of years back, right? There was a rush uh, around saying, let me acquire digital skills, right? Let me understand what are impressions, CTRs, uh, click-through rates, conversion rates. Uh, I think all this has become table stakes now. I mean, this will has to become a part of your curriculum and learning, right? As you, uh, and this is table stakes. This is like, you know, if I have to say, this is learning the uh, four P's of marketing by Kotler. This is like, this isn't that, uh, uh, realm now, but a skill of the future that I believe you know will will, will uh, people should start looking at is uh, machine learning and data analytics, right? Because uh, today online businesses are only managed through data, right? All data that is you know getting uh, uh, captured around a customer and the purchase behavior, right? And the entire ecosystem. Uh, these businesses are purely run on data analytics and then decisions are taken in terms of what to roll out, where to roll out and when to roll out. So in my view, uh, I think Chris won, but uh, machine learning, data analytics is a skill that we, you know, that has to be acquired uh, to stay relevant in the future. Hello. Okay. I had a little bit more uh, involved answer in, in some sense. And I was, when, when we discussed this question, I said, you know, what should I, what should I say? So guess what? I went in and did some Google, right? Obviously everybody goes and does some Google. And there were so many articles around what are the top five skills? What are the top seven skills? What are the top 20 skills um, to be in this space? And then again, as we are on this, in this forum, I said, let me go back to my MBA days and think uh, what, a, what, a, what a Gabby Mendoza or a Nishi might have said, right? Why do you want to be a general manager rather than a specialist kind of a situation, right? So as Alpesh was saying, you can be a data scientist without a doubt, right? And you can be a great copywriter. Yes, without a doubt, you can be. You can be a, a guy who is an expert on databases and SQL. Yes, you can be. But like we were to say that, do you really need to know how to prepare a balance sheet or do you need to know how to read a balance sheet? I think that is where the question is also for the young people um, who are sort of graduating and trying to see what do they want to do? Do they want to sort of find the go deeper into an area? Because the, as Alpesh said, there could be so many details in that space or do you want to be a little bit more of a general manager kind of a role, right? Or overall marketing. 
So some of the points, like I said, looking at Google and with my personal experience, um, I actually noted down maybe six or seven, not maybe 20 skills or whatever, but things like data analytics, right? You need to understand that. And when I mean understand that, not just to see the Excel sheets and all of that, but really have a much better understanding of you know, data analytics and analysis, because there's so much data coming. There, I think there are many questions on the chat where people are talking about data and you know, there is so much data. So without a doubt, as we all know, there is so much data, but how to make a sort of uh, information out of that data and then make it actionable. That is the critical aspect here. So certainly you need to have a pretty good understanding of that. Two words that I mentioned in the past, like SEO, SEM, right? Which is search engine optimization and search engine marketing. There's a lot of science behind it, but once again, for a good marketer, need to have a great understanding of what actually it means, right? What, what is it that I'm trying to convey and how is it being read by my prospective customers? The other thing is advanced kind of knowledge of social media. You know, we use that word very loosely and social media is no more me alo going and posting on LinkedIn that, hey, Fitbit does a great job or on a Facebook, but there is so much more to it and understanding it in detail. And also because all the platforms have their own unique tools of tracking a, a user and also tracking what they do. So really need to have that platform specific understanding. And then I think some of the basics of marketing, like I said, in terms of content creation, because now it is not only copywriting, it is so much more, like I said, it is video. How do you create content? Actually, now you can create content on the fly and serve it to each and every customer individually. You can customize to that level. So having that understanding, I think becomes important. Understanding of consumer journey. How are apps really working? What is happening through apps and what is the consumer journey of a, of a, of a potential customer? That I think becomes very important, right? And then overall, as Alpesh also said, understanding of automation, whether it is machine learning, whether it is AI, not easy to be expert in that. But again, like I said, having that general manager cap to have a good enough understanding. And overall, you have to be a great people person, I think. That can never go away. You have to have a great people person and have the ability to execute and be a, team, a leader. Without that, again, you cannot be successful. So that's my summary of what it takes to be a good digital marketer. Fantastic. Okay, uh, I'm done with all the questions that I had. Uh, <laughs> Nikhil, uh, how do we, uh, uh, do we do we read out some questions from the general chat? Can uh, you? Yeah, what I suggest is because it's a very, I mean, compact group. If somebody wants to raise, like we have Sukhendra Saputro, who is the batchmate of Alok Shankar. So Sukhendra, uh, can we see your lovely face and we'll un I'll unmute you? so that uh, you can ask the question and you can meet your, uh, talk to your friend, Sukhundro, because he has done a lot of CP on the, yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Let's see you again. <laughs> <laughs> Roommate, batsmate, <laughs> my best friend in CP. <laughs> Long time no see you. Indeed. Hello, hello. Actually, I would like to know because you're very expert now in B2C. I'm doing also B2B and B2C right now. Okay. And we are doing a waste management. Sometimes the problem in Indonesia, there are a lot of more regulations happening. So the, is there any competitive advantage of the nation still occur if you are talking about the B2C market? Did you say re regulations? Regulations yeah. happens changing every time. So, so uh, is, B2C, uh, is there any... See, I think advantages or not, uh, I'm not sure because if you're looking at B2C within a country, and I, I, the way I understand your question is you're saying, uh, uh, you know, whether there is an advantage of regulation for B2C within the country. Yes. I think, I think it is more a question of how do you sort of maximize the potential given the regulation in the country, right? Because yep. there are many regulations in India. If I talk about, I'm not so uh, sort of sure about uh, Indonesian regulations, but there are a lot of regulations in the country in India, say example of who can sell online. Okay, there mm -hmm. are regulations around that. If you are a foreign company, you possibly cannot just sell it online B2C. So the question would be, how do you set up your partnerships? How do you set up your channels to market to still be able to comply with your regulations and, and, and reach your desire, desired consumer base? For example, Amazon in India does not buy any product or sell. Amazon is simply mm -hmm. a platform because that is what the regulation is. But does it mean that I can't sell 
through Amazon? Yes, I can sell. I have partners who list on the platform and sell. So given your regulations, you have to really see which is the most effective and efficient way to address your customers. That's what I would say. Thank you. Very good answer. Amazon is also investing in Indonesia, I think, start next year. I'm sure so, it will. Yes, sure. Okay, Thanks, thank you. Terima thank you, Alok. Terima kasih, sama-sama. Bye. Uh, anybody else would like to have a question? I mean, anybody? I mean, uh, because there were some questions earlier. If they're answered, it's fine. If anybody wants to ask a question, they can uh, raise their hand and unmute. Uh, I think uh, Professor Nishi is also here, I suppose. Mr. N uh, yeah, I think Natarajan has raised his hand. So Nat Natarajan, where is Natarajan? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, Natarajan. I'm can you unmute yourself? Yeah, I have unmuted. Yeah, we can hear you, Natarajan. Hi. Uh, how are you doing? <laughs> Good to hear uh, all of you guys and especially Alok. Uh, the question is uh, to both of you is uh, that, uh, see, there is uh, over a period of time, there has been a lot of uh, change in the consumer behavior, okay, where uh, consumers have become, you know, they're ready to pay a bigger price for a better product and a good service, customer service, okay? And they're willing to pay the price, okay? Now, uh, within your organization and Alpesh, uh, how do you treat these kind of customers and how do you recognize and then, uh, you, you know, set apart a process that can address this particular concern? Maybe that can help the uh, companies itself devise a different uh, marketing uh, strategy. That was my question. I would be very keen to know. Sure. Uh, Alok, can I go first? Yes, please. Always. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Rajan, uh, uh, you know, this is how we look at it, right? Uh, so, we uh, typically start identifying cohorts, right, who are actually, uh, you know, buying your premium set of products. They have cohorts who are buying you regularly, right? And let me take examples of these two uh, and then try to build it up. Right. So, you know, when we realize that there are people who are actually, you know, buying a higher basket size compared, relatively compared to what the other customers buy, then they for us become a special set of customers. Now, mm -hmm. what we typically look at is a as uh, so, you know, uh, when we get started, then we typically look at what are the little changes that we can bring to the table for them uh, that would help them buy us more and stay with us for long. So, for example, let's say if I had a set of customers uh, who are living in uh, zones where I have delivery times that are becoming better by the day, then I would actually go and reach out to them and say, you know, yesterday I was delivering a product to you in three days. Today it would take me two days to deliver the same set of product. Mm -hmm. uh, I would take back my innovation to them, right? Uh, and uh, say, you know, this is like a, uh, this, you are like my uh, privilege set to sort of have a look at uh, what I have to offer right now. Yeah. Uh, or even let's say if I were to uh, look at data, uh, around what their buying habits are, then I would churn out, uh, say, combos, right, which is very frequently bought in this category, right, at mm -hmm. the prices and offer it to them first, right. Now, uh, having said, so this is this is how we would typically start uh, build, you know, building on uh, these sort of customers and say the end objective for us would be to what? Would be to, A, say, A, increase the stickiness of these customers on our platform so that they right. don't go anywhere. And second is you would start, you know, as data keeps building up, assess what is the customer lifetime value, right? That we can derive uh, or the, uh, from this uh, customer, right? When I say lifetime value, for how long will the customers continue to be with us? Uh, what will they transact, right? And if I see that there is potential in that, then I don't mind investing a little ahead of time for those set of customers to ensure that they stay with us. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Thanks. I think Natarajan, for us, from a device point of view, if you look at it, it's actually a very simple kind of a strategy that you have, right? You have different product features, product sets, which are at different price points, right? Mm -hmm. So you may have a device which is fully loaded at an X price, and maybe as you segment your potential market, you go and maybe change the form factor, maybe a little bit of the functionality. It could be as simple as size. Size does matter. So, you know, those are some of the things that, that you may change. But at the same time, there are certain things that are common for all. For example, if it is, say, after-sales service, that you typically do not want to differentiate on, right? You want to provide the best sort of um, service possible. 
and also a thing like experience i don't think you want to compromise or have a a tiered structure on experience the experience needs to be the best for all your customers because end of the day mm-hmm. they are your clients or they are your customers so my personal belief is that is not an area that you want to differentiate on but yes certainly from a from a product point of view and maybe if you want to differentiate you price certain services additional so that it is very clear that what you are paying for it's like a premium service so that's the strategy mm. i would i would look at and follow oh lovely thank you uh, first vijay sardha and then i'll call on aditya vijay go ahead Uh, hi, uh, Alok sir and Alpesh sir. So uh, both of you said at different point of times that uh, you have to start with one thing when you start a new business, whether it is cosmetics or mobile or uh, wearables, and eventually move on to different sections. What I mean is first you start with either branding, then move on to R&D, then move on to production, and so on and so forth. I think Alpesh sir said that a lot of Indian brands failed because they did not venture into R&D. Or production, they were just outsourcing it, buying it, and packaging I, it. I said that. I'll pay oh, you for it. I said it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So uh, my question was that: What are the triggers which will tell a company, okay, now you want to move to the next section? So you start with branding. So what triggers should a company look for to evaluate that? Okay, now branding is done. I have to move on to production or R and D or something. And then how do you assess that? What is the value i have to assign for the company because most of the startups have limited fund to start with and they can prioritize one over the other so how do you do that alpesh you want to go first or do you want me to go first so sure, uh, take the question now i'll go after you okay yeah. so so vijay i think if if i were to look at it from a startup point of view right the fact that you are starting up my assumption is there is some unique proposition that you have that is why you have a startup right yeah so you would have to first focus on what your unique proposition is because as a startup you must have identified that okay this is something that i am solving for that's the word i keep using when it comes to funding guys right what are you solving for so surely you would have found some unique niche that you are solving for right okay. which you think also is sustainable i don't know if prof nishi is there or not but uh, if uh, if he's uh, you know so no, is it no, sir- no, no, no. He's there. He, he will be great. He will be grading you in the end. So, exactly. Uh, 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 so don't try to put a caveat and try to save yourself. You just go on answering. जो भी जो भी bullshit किया सब ले लेगा. Interest के साथ बात करेंगे बात करेंगे. Okay. So so what what is it that you were solving for, right? Then how is it unique? The next question probably would be, is it sustainable, right? Do you have that competitive advantage with you, and how sustainable is that? So as you start. then at at different stages of your evolution you might find that there are other areas that you need to expand on or develop or diversify into to continue with your uh, like i said differentiation and your uniqueness and the value mm-hmm. proposition that you have right so initially i thought okay i will just uh, market a phone for example right and then i might find that hey everybody's got the same phone so where is my differentiation left so do i need to go and do a little bit more of r and d and create something unique for example right so different stages of your uh, of the organization different aspects and it is not only internal you also need to be cognizant of the external environment what is happening there right and you have okay. you may have to pivot very quickly okay okay alpesh uh, all yours thanks alo i have a slightly different take to this uh, vijay see if you look at startups today right uh, and i spoke about this in the earlier part of the conversation there's a very robust ecosystem in place today right you have uh, three pale manufacturers you have last mile logistics partners right uh, uh, who are typically doing the job for you so if you have found a great business idea and you have a great product that uh, you want to start building then look at it in three phases right i would just want to focus on saying how do i build this brand and create more awareness and consumption around this brand right uh, Uh, i will continue working with this ecosystem to sort of improve and uh, improve my and better the consumer offering and the experience right but it would never mean that i get i venture into that because i don't want to focus on that at all i want to just focus on the brand and my customer so if i were to you know sort of sum it up and in the life of a startup right an early early stage startup would typically say you know i have a robust ecosystem around me i have a fab business idea or a product right i want to create a brand i will move on to platforms quickly as acquire customers reduce my acquisition cost right once i move to the next phase in the mid stage of the growth phase 
then I would say, how do I, you know, increase my sales potential? If I have captured all these horizontals and verticals, is there a need for me to sort of now go offline and say, make it more touch and feel and, you know, increase the awareness and then comes okay. the expansion stage, right? And in the expansion stage, that's when I would uh, consider about, you know, uh, adjacent categories that I could get into, right? or uh, international markets that I can I could get into. So, you know, let me give you an example. A, a Amazon, uh, you know, if you go Google about, uh, there's a brand called WakeFit, right? Uh, mm -hmm. They've typically revelated how mattresses are sold, right? Now, uh, you, you would have read in the papers, a few days back, they raised uh, 185 CRM funding. This is yeah. to grow their furniture business now. now. That's an adjacent category. They said, we will also sell you the now we'll also sell you the cot on which this mattress can be placed. Right. That's how that's how companies are moving. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, Aditya, uh, that will be the last question and then the floor will be given to Professor Nishi. Aditya. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, Mr. Alok. Good evening, Mr. Uh, Alpesh. Hey, Aditya. Hey, Hello. Okay. Uh, my question is very specific and very small. There was a point wherein people are no longer doing a Google search first, but shopping right from their Instagram app or their Facebook app. Uh, however, in the recent past, I have seen new uh, apps come up such as Bulbul, for example, which is only towards shopping. It's kind of like that uh, Home Shop 18 or TV Shop 18, but on an app format. Uh, do you think such formats will take a precedence in the future in the B2C format or would uh, established companies like Fitbit or Face Cosmetics stick to the mainstream social media apps itself? Uh, Alok, should I take this one first? Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, so Aditya, uh, I think it's, it's I, I don't think the, uh, uh, you know, as you go ahead for companies like us, it would be an either or approach. It is going to be an and approach. And if I had to talk to you about Bulbul and some statistics around that, right? Uh, when we, when we you know, uh, so we, we, we deal with Bulbul. So I, I know a little bit around, you know, where do customers come from? Now, all the customers who typically are on Bulbul, you know, uh, wanting to buy through this uh, video shopping uh, experience and app are typically you know, are not the urban uh, affluent customers. Yes. Now that's where this is, you know, making a difference. You are actually reaching, reaching out to a section of people who would never hop on to the platforms where you are actually present on. So uh, this is, you know, as long as these platforms are bringing in uh, customer cohorts, new customer cohorts that you did not have in your kitty, uh, we would want to continue to capitalize on these uh, kind of apps. Are they here to stay in the future? Absolutely, because, uh, you know, uh, again, a cliched statement, but uh, we're a diverse country. We have different customer types, right? Today, uh, a rural customer also wants to buy online, uh, is shopping online. His habits are very different. Uh, his, the way he shops online is very different from how an urban customer shops online today. And this is where, you know, bulbuls of the world actually come in and are helping them, uh, you know, uh, take on uh, online shopping. Yeah, I, and, and I would just add to that, I think I used the word before also omni-channel in, in some sense, right? So as Alpesh said, it's not either or, it's probably wherever, wherever you think your customer is, you want to be available there, right? And even more than say just the apps, you maybe want to take a step higher and say you want to be say present online, right? So today maybe it's Amazon and Facebook or Flipkart. Tomorrow, it could be somebody else totally. But the question is, what is your online strategy, right? So where I'm coming to this is, and it probably goes back to the marketer's skill is, your data and content needs to be in such a way that even if it is being consumed on Bulbul, it is doing justice to your products and services, right? People will use whatever channel they want to use to get to you. So it should not be that, oh, I can't render a good information on Bulbul because it is only built for, uh, say, desktops, for example, right? So if, if they're using Bulbul, so be it. If they use Google, so be it. But what my job is to try and ensure that my data or my information and in products are available wherever the customer chooses to, you know, sample it, try it, or get information about it. That's what I would do. Wouldn't worry about an app or two. Got it, sir. Thank you very much. Very valuable inputs. Thank you very much. As they say, the best is for the last. Prof Nishi, all your... <laughs> Yeah, exactly, sir. So if I can, before before Prof comes in and I'll say you know, almost so 25 years, hopefully he can probably see what was a disaster or the good things he did with the students that he taught, right? So it's almost, what, 96 that we passed out. So maybe I'm sure he'll have an opinion as to 
how how poorly or well did we do? <laughs> well, actually, thank you very much. Uh, it's lovely to be here. Yeah, you make me very proud, all of you. Really terrific stuff. We weren't wrong, you know. You definitely de deserve to be on that dean's list. Yeah, definitely. So uh, yeah, it is good stuff. I, I don't, I don't, you know. It, there is so much wisdom that has been dispensed that I have very little to add to it, except, uh, you know, um, one thing that does concern me. Uh, I attended a webinar some time ago when um, I think uh, Johnny Uman and one other guy. What is his name? Um, can you hear me? Yeah, Thomas, we can hear you, sir. Yeah, Thomas, just, Thomas, yes, Thomas. Thomas. And and the and, and the we we have a world which has uh, been frozen in time with this Corona thing, and it has had a, a, an immense impact on the way businesses run or don't run, <laughs> the way countries run or don't run. Um, uh, it has a, had an immense impact. And I heard one person say that, oh, the vaccines are still two and a half years away, and so we'll have to carry on like this, that, and the other. At that point in time, it did strike us that some of the finest brains in the world were working on a vaccine, and that they were saying that it's going to be coming out in six months, and it's out now. You know, it's being used in America and Canada and England, and it's going to be out very soon. So I'm just wondering, if things normalize, say by July, August, September of next year, or whatever, what will be the changes in the marketing mix? How will the marketing mix change now that the corona terror is dissipated? Or will, or will it change at all? Does it change at all? I mean, will it still be an online emphasis or will there be other things that will happen? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question, but maybe some of these, you know, the people over here who are top professionals, maybe they can tell us. I, I certainly have a view, sir. If uh, I, I, what yeah. I, can, I can say is that when we were discussing this webinar also, and I think one of the points I said was, and I probably overused the word kind of indexing of weightage or weightage of various things, right? Mm -hmm. so, so what we have seen is, and... Uh, the fact is you really need to be at times proactive, but also at times very quickly reactive of changing environment conditions. And a side mm -hmm. issue is sir, that when we had that very, very animated discussion with you, you were talking about airlines. And, uh, and I do still remember you said, what if the vaccine comes back early? Maybe the mm -hmm. airline stocks will rise. So I did buy yeah. Indigo and that was a good tip. That's the separate tip. issue. But yeah. um, the, the, the issue is that if I see myself before the mm -hmm. pandemic came in, I, yeah. we, as a strategy, had a very balanced online and offline strategy. Okay. okay. But now that pandemic came in and my offline was pretty much shut down because the country was pretty much yeah. locked up, right? Yeah. So what yeah. did I do? Because I had online, I basically mm -hmm. over-indexed on online because my offline was going. So for yep. me, it was not a great scramble as such. I already mm -hmm. had a very clear strategy online. I could just mm -hmm. enhance it. Okay. All right. I just need to ensure what happens next. Now you're saying if the footfalls start going back offline, yep. I'm already there and I might see that it sort of settles back again, but it is also entirely possible that my online as a total business might be five points higher than what it was before the pandemic. But I mm -hmm. do not expect that the offline will become zero, right? It is just no. a question of adjusting to the new levels or the new realities. So maybe I was 50, 50, I might be 45, 55, but I don't okay. expect it to be sort of reset in the entirety is what I see is happening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very perceptive insight. Anybody else has got any views on that? Uh, if I may add, if I may uh, add to that professor, uh, yeah. my, again, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, you know, hypothesizing on this. My view is, uh, you know, a lot of customers in the pre-COVID world who are only offline have now actually started coming online. So uh, to acquire customers in the future through an online medium would be far more easier. Or uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, someone whom I couldn't have reached out to in the earlier world, uh, uh, pre-COVID, uh, it would become easier for me because the customer himself or herself has now come on to online platforms, right? Uh, <laughs> the second, where I see is now the same set of customers, right? 
post having take, uh, done my first purchase, I wouldn't have been able to communicate with the customer, collaborate with the customer, uh, because uh, the customer was not uh, accessing as simple things as emails or stuff like that, or was, was, was yeah. not following me on my social channels. Yeah. Now, all this will become a possibility, right? And uh, so uh, I think we will, post-COVID, we are just sort of uh, set to witness a fabulous, uh, 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 you know, a fabulous time where uh, this entire talk about, you know, when e-com came, we said, well, online stay or offline go away. I think both <laughs> online and offline will stay. Uh, the ability to acquire customers from the offline world, right, uh, uh, would become uh, far, uh, I would say, easier compared to in the relative past. And uh, the ability to communicate, communicate and collaborate with them would also become a lot more uh, uh, easier. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very, very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And one, one other, that, that's very interesting. I, I've never had the privilege of being in the same case room with you, but that was a very, very incisive answer. Thank you very much. Uh, I also was struck by what, uh, what, what uh, my, my old student Alok had said was that at some stage, you know, you, you don't only remain a pure marketing man. You, I, I'm, if there is any such, such thing as a pure marketing man, I don't know how pure marketing people are, but anyway, uh, they, you have to move beyond your specialism into becoming a businessman. And the greatest marketing people in the world are good businessmen. So I, I like that. I like that movement. You know, you go from when you join an organization, you you are a sort of specialist, and then as you move up the organization, you learn how to be a generalist and to work with people in information technology and HR and R and D and so on and so forth. But finally, when you get to the board and to governance levels, even if you come from a marketing background, you have to know how to read that balance sheet, that P and L account, how to make them, how to understand the financials. So I think that's very, very important in any discussion on marketing that it doesn't stop there. You have to go from specialist to generalist to businessman. Business. And I think that that businessman part was, that, that came out very nicely. Thank you very much. That was very encouraging. I also must thank Nikhil. Nikhil has done a fantastic job. I have not seen any other business school being so energetic, so effervescent and so visible all over the world with the kind of work that he's done. So I salute what he does. And uh, thank you very much. You know, you are really making a lot of old professors like me very proud. Well done. Thank you very much. Nikhil, Thanks, you are on mute. We can't hear you, Nikhil. Sorry. Yeah. Really? Thank you, uh, thank no, you, no, we can't hear you. Thank you, Professor Nishi, for your kind words. As you always said, trust the process. <laughs> yep. All, all the students who have passed from AIM have trusted the process and are still trusting the process and <laughs> trying to reinvent and... <laughs> And uh, then I said in the beginning of the program today that uh, ace, three ace marketers are here. Uh, yep. I, thought I was not wrong because no. uh, it was a fantastic thing. And Rahul Segal, uh, and uh, I mean, you were, you were able to hold on to people's attention uh, by even uh, throwing that Fitbit uh, kind of uh, uh, 10,000 rupees uh, <laughs> the moral of the story is never trust a marketing campaign. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Rahul has always been a pivot for all our offline uh, events which we had in uh, Mumbai a few years ago. Uh, uh, he has always been quite uh, forthcoming and helpful. So thank you, Rahul. Thank you, Alok. And thank, thank you, Alpesh. It was a great thing. And I would like to also thank uh, Sukendra Saputro. Uh, and yes. uh, uh, the oh, yeah. uh, Kartika, can you uh, can I unmute you? Kartika is the uh, Ikatan uh, Alumni Association of India's. I'm mean, sorry, Indonesia's president. And yeah. Kartika is uh, M MM M eighty nine, Professor Nishi. Uh, okay. And uh, she's a AAA awardee two years ago, and she okay. was the Salem group. And uh, I had put it on the fame uh, chapter heads today. And she had put it on the Ikatan. And as a result, there is a mini reunion between Sukendro and uh, Alok today. So this, yeah. is, uh, this yeah. is the power of webinar. And, and even Professor Mukherjee, he would remember him because Sukendro was Of course there I remember him. Yes. So, of, course yeah. was of course I remember him. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 he, and he's, he's still looking as young as he used to when he was... <laughs> Sukendro, if you want to say something, you can say, I can unmute you. 
you can say hello to professor nishi yeah hi professor nishi <laughs> thank yeah, you yeah 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 it's good to see you it's so wonderful to see you so this is i mean at the end of the day uh, the webinar is information gather i mean information uh, sharing but more is down memory lane meeting people across the globe and uh, thank you all and hope that uh, now this is the 45th webinar and in short time we will reach golden jubilee and hope to you hope to see you all uh, next week also share it okay, nikhil one second nikhil since yeah. i am the moderator of the session i get to i get to close the session <laughs> so, but before but before that i just want to share the screen i hope i share the screen yes this, yes this yes. is next week uh, 27 uh, this is dr lok mishra he is the chief executive officer of my network and uh, darshan would be uh, mod mo moderator uh, for the event yeah all yours yes so before we all leave nikhil we just want to wish you in advance for your 50th birthday which is coming up in the next 3 days so happy birthday <laughs> Thank you. Happy birthday. Happy, Happy birthday. 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 So thank, th thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye